Hi, I'm Dr. Rosa Sales, and I welcome you to another uh, monthly shift. Shift is the Ezra Project's uh, interview program where each month we talk about something that's of importance to the Black community and the church community. Tonight, we're privileged to have two guests with us who will take us into a conversation about sex trafficking. Before I introduce our guests, however, I want to give you a little bit of information. Um, very often we think of human trafficking and we think of only sex trafficking. In truth, there are other kinds of trafficking, including la labor trafficking. Um, children uh, are also trafficked sometimes from um, uh, to go into wars in other countries. People, we also think of tra sex trafficking as bringing people to the United States, but that's not true. Uh, there is not a state in the United States where trafficking does not occur. There are young people who are trafficked, both male and female, sometimes as young as 12. Um, and we think that we are exempt because we are in a church community. We think that it's okay. It's not our kids. It's not our problem. And that's just not true. So as uh, I've gone around the country and Renee has gone around the country, kind of letting churches know, my mission is to let churches know that this is an issue, it's happening in their churches and we need to do something about it. I have yet to find a church where the pastor or a person in that church does not come back to me and say, this is a problem, it's affecting my members in this way or that way. So we want you to be informed, we want you to know what's going on, we want you to know the truth. And so we're pleased tonight to have as our guests, Renee Shepherd Owens. Um, I'm gonna let each of them tell you a little bit about themselves, but Renee Shepherd Owens is involved in uh, human trafficking education. And she's been doing this work and doing some rescue work for over 15 years. And Lakeisha Walker, who is going to tell us her story tonight. She has uh, founded an organization and she is a survivor and she is indeed a thriver. So we want, we welcome her to tell her story as well. So I'm gonna introduce Renee and then she can introduce Lakeisha and we'll just kind of go back and forth. Want to tell you, if you have a question, please put it in the chat. We have somebody manning the Facebook live chat and so we'll know when questions come in and we will take pauses periodically for questions. So please join the conversation. It's the way that we can share with one another. And at the end of this, we're gonna give you some other information specifically about what churches can do. So with that, Renee Shepherd Owens, Lakeisha Walker, welcome. Good evening, everyone. I'm Renee Shepherd Owens. I am the uh, president uh, over the Compassion, Mercy and Justice Ministry. Um, one, how I got involved with human trafficking over uh, fifth, almost 14, 15 years ago, uh, because I'm a Chicago Park supervisor, one day a young lady walked into the park and uh, she asked for help. And her asking for help, she also shared what was happening to her. Um, at that time, I did not know anything about human trafficking. And once she kind of shared it with us, because we were kind of ignorant at that time of the seriousness of it, we uh, contacted the police. And what we found out later on was that uh, there was an undercover operation going on with the FBI, uh, with the police department at that time, and uh, the state's attorney's office is called Operation Little Girl Lost. And they ended up arresting nine people uh, down the street from the park where I work. I was so grateful um, that we didn't turn her away. But the real hero here was uh, not us at all, but it was the young lady that was able to escape. And in her escaping, she was able to save all the other young ladies. The youngest probably was about 12 years old. They were able to save them from the constant horror that they had went through and were going through. Um, it was finally the neighbors that saw the constant traffic of, of young ladies going back and forth, but it took them a while, you all, because we, we, we mind our business too much and don't mind the right business enough. And what that means is we, 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 we welcome nosy neighbors. Everybody needs at least one nosy neighbor on your block. Not the kind that get in your business, but the kind that protects your business. And uh, they finally got tired. They called the police and they began to watch them. These girls had went through a horrific, horrible time. So I said to myself, uh, wow, 
that's all I said, y'all. You know how we do, we watch the news and we just say, wow, that's so sad. Well, I, because I'm a child of God, God don't play that. <laughs> when he exposes you to a thing, he has a reason why he exposes you. And so the Lord had began to stir up something inside of me where I could not rest in it. And in my uncomfortableness, God began to deal with me. And that night, I, I, at that time, they had this show, uh, America's Most Wanted. See, I like to watch Blue Bloods. I like Law and Order. I like all of that. I like to pretend like I'm one of them, like a big kid. Well, America's Most Wanted was on that night. And, and, and Lord and behold, what were they? What they had a special program on human trafficking. Young lady talked. I sat, and, sat there watching her, cried like a baby and said, why am I crying? I don't even know this chick. You know, you know, I talked back to the TV. You know, we all talk to ourselves. And so I said, hmm, and I left it alone. But the Lord kept dealing with me. So I said, okay, is it real in Chicago? Because I live here. What, how real is it? And when they, when I had uh, connected with some organizations, had some people take me on the street. Uh, and what I found on our street was absolutely horrible. Uh, I was able to spend time with survivors. I was able to actually talk to prostitutes on the street at that time. I was able to sit with pimps and they educated me. Some of them scared me to death, but they still educated me. So the reality is, is when we think it's not near, it's more nearer than you think. Um, but being a child of God, and like I said, again, when God gives you something, he expects you to do something. There's a scripture in Micah 6, 8, and it says, and what does the Lord require of you? To act justly, love mercy, walk humbly with your God. So you can't sit on things that God gives you. You have to speak up and you have to stand up like our young people are doing in the streets today with Black Lives Matter and all of those things. And at this time, you all, because of COVID, uh, unfortunately, uh, a lot of young girls probably had went through more horror than they ever had because everything was shut down. And because everything shut down, they can hide more and do more damage at that time. And if you notice, as you watch the news, those that don't want to watch the news, they were, they're bolder now. They're, the, the little girl about a month or so ago waiting on her bus and the man comes up in the van, but she was tough. She fought that joke off and they were able to get him. So without the education and without us uh, not educating ourselves, because we perish for a lack of knowledge, and, and, and parents today are not like parents be, before, <laughs> they've got to be involved. Uh, you know, you can't give no kid no iPad and let it be your babysitter. You got to know what they got on that little joker. Uh, because that is how they lure the young girls through social media. And uh, so um, because I've been doing this for a while, I have met several survivors. The youngest survivor that stirred my heart was one that they were able to rescue that was eight years old. That's just too much for anybody to fathom men having sex with an eight-year-old child. So human trafficking is what we call modern day slavery. Yes. It is the force and coercion of labor and sex trafficking. So like Dr. Sale said, there are two kinds. You have labor trafficking, which is where people force folks to work for them for free. And then you have sex trafficking. Um, and so there are many uh, ways in which they recruit. It's not just snatching them off the street. They, they have many kind of ways in which they lure girls into sex trafficking. The more you're educated, the more you get involved in community affairs, the more we can protect our children. And so, as I said before, I meet survivors and one that I have recently met that we have connected with, and that is Miss Kalisha, Lakeisha Walker. And I would like for her to just come in now and share her story Hold on, because I don't like to... Mm -hmm. Right. But before Lakeisha uh, begins, I do want to tell anybody who's looking, if you have a teenager in particular, a 12 year old, bring them on and let them see because they need to know what's out there. Very often, one kid saves another kid because they know what mm -hmm. to look for. So as Lakeisha shares her story, it's very important that not only are adults, uh, we try to shield our children 
but in reality, we're not protecting our children. So if you have a young person in the house, if you can text somebody, call somebody, please tell them to tune in right now because we want them to be them. Okay. And since you mentioned okay. that, Dr. Sales, when I went to go and uh, what I do is go to wherever I'm invited um, to go and teach and share uh, about human trafficking. When I went to one church, it is because we did a workshop there and it's because we educated some teenagers when, uh, and at that time, this young lady and her friend were on Facebook thinking that they were talking to teenage boys, when in reality, they were talking to adult men. And one of the young ladies was on that didn't make the workshop. Her friend did. When she got home, she called her friend and said, I'm going to meet him now. They thought it was the cutest thing. But the something stirred up in this young lady's spirit based on what she had just been taught. And she told her mom. And the mom called the little girl's mom because that other teenager knew exactly. At least she had enough sense to tell her friend where she was meeting him at. And they sent the police there and it was a man waiting to take her. Mm -hmm. So you're absolutely right. So now Sister Walker, it's turned over to you to share your story. Welcome. Thank you so much, Dr. Seals, um, for allowing me to be on your pl platform. And thank you so much, Miss Renee. You've definitely truly been like a mentor and <laughs> like a mother figure and everything to me um, during this process. Before I start, I usually start off by telling you what I've accomplished thus far. I want to start backwards first. So basically, I was born like any other um, child is born. And I came into the world born to my parents who were addicted to drugs. Um, I was actually thrown off of a building um, at the age of two years old, and I ended up bouncing around in the DCFS system. So I'm going to make this as brief as I can because it's actually long, but I'm going to sum it up. Um, after that, I, I lived a lifestyle where I was molested. I didn't feel, you know, love. I ended up in the arms of my grandmother who really tried to do everything she could to protect me. And she tried to love me the best way that she knew how. Um, but for some reason, it was still just something missing. I don't know if it wasn't because it wasn't my parents or what. Um, but anyways, I got all the way up to being about 16 years old where I experienced my first domestic violence relationship. And it had gotten so bad, um, I was kicked and pulled down alleys and beat up and it got so bad that my grandmother actually called the police on the on the guy um then by the time I was 17 years old I had met another guy now the other guy that I met is what I like to call a Romeo pimp um he was nice to me he wasn't all evil like the last guy you know that I came across um in 16 so this guy seemed really really sweet and this is how they get you from this point on I want you to listen real clear to everything I say because this is very very important it's almost like they seduce you in a sense so you know he pretended to be I'll love you you don't feel love you know it's like he sensed that I had low self-esteem um and he just would, you know, tell me like, I'm here for you. You have me and all of these type of things. So they kind of play mad games. So he had taken me into a strip club um, off of a dare. This is very important if there's any teenagers or children listening because I had suffered with peer pressure. I like to think on one end, I had experienced the worst, of, the worst part of life through my parents being on drugs. But on the other end, I pretty much was raised as a suburban kid where my grandmother's way of telling me like about the streets was just keep your, your skirt down. So I really didn't know anything, you know, about anything. So he dares me to go into a strip club. And I just said, okay, because I didn't really know what else to really say. So I go into this strip club. By the end of that night, I met the strip club. I didn't even think he was going to do it that quick. But I'm in this strip club and I'm like, OK, I went in. So can I leave now? Next thing you know, he, he has girls and everybody just surrounding me. It was almost like it was already planned. So I know now what I didn't know then, which was it was already planned. Um, next thing you know, they're giving me clothes to put on. They're seducing me. A lot of these predators work with other people. That's very important. Like they're not just working by they, themselves. A lot of this is about money. It's all about money. But anyway, so um, by the time I would say night three hit, all of a sudden there's another guy coming around. Now this guy is what you call a gorilla pimp. 
and he's cutthroat, rough, all of that. It's no, I love you, no convincing. He just came straight in, like beating me up. And the other guy literally disappeared. So I ended up getting my head bashed into the window sill, you know, and that's how I was told basically, I'm about to sell you. You don't have a choice. This is what is about to go on. So to make a very long story short, um, I continuously tried to get away from this man. He would not uh, really let me break free. I was beat. I was sold to dozens of men um, against my own will. I didn't really have a choice on nothing I did. Actually, the only choice that I had was my name, which was Glamour. And that came from my grandmother nicknaming me Gamma Girl. Like, I don't know if y'all remember the glam, like the commercial. Maybe it's <laughs> Maybelline or whatever. Um, but other than that, I didn't have the choice of me trying to run away. So it got so bad where he just locked me in this room with like bolted locks. I could not get out. I was fed water like a dog. A lot of times I couldn't even eat. And that, which that really, really bothered me. Um, people would, you know, come in and out to sleep with me. And I had learned really quick that in order for me to probably escape, I'm going to probably have to play alone. Like I've always been a fighter by nature. So, you know, these pimps, they fill your head or predators. They fill your head with so many things that are opposite from who you actually are. He was always telling me that I was nothing. I would never be nothing. And I would be no greater than that. And I always felt like it wasn't true, even though I wasn't even sure if it was true or not, you know, cause I'm just thinking I'm trapped. I don't have a choice. Um, I could go further, but I don't want to just take over like that. I don't know if people have questions or what. And to sum it up, I was able to, to escape. And now I've come back after all these years, after, after I was able to break free and escape, which I feel like Honestly, it was nothing but the grace of God. A lot of people try to ask me like, what was it? What was it? It was God and I had a pastor and this is the part where the church comes in. That's so important. I had a pastor that represented a safe place. Like I had the type of pastor, her name is Dr. Anella Lewis. Um, she would allow me to talk to her like without, you know, my grandmother around or anybody around. So I just always felt safe. So when I, when my back was against the wall and I was running from these pimps in downtown Chicago, actually, that was at the point where he had trusted me and I was running trick, you know, from trick to trick, trying to get away. And um, a trick ended up helping me, but also trying to violate me at the same time, because he actually, you know, I seen God on him. So I just thought like, maybe that's why I'm supposed to run. Um, turns out they wasn't really into no God at all. Like they tried to um, rape me once I got to that place. And I found myself trying to escape from that situation as well. And my pastor actually got on the phone and negotiated with the man for my life. And I was, you know, taken to church where everybody cried and prayed over me. It was, of course, people was looking at me like I was crazy because I had that blind hair and, you know, I had glass all in my foot and I was dirty and I didn't care because I had my life and my life has never been the same. One more thing I want to say, well, actually two more things. That's real important. Um, so after all of that happened, I was told, not by my pastor, but by my grandmother, may she rest in peace, but I was told not to tell anybody because in the black societies it's or the black community is kind of like that sometimes where it's like, you know, no to counseling, no to talking about whatever you've been through. So due to that, I ended up trying to uh, commit suicide at least three times. And I think this is so important for anybody that may be suffering or going through it. I went through like a deep depression. It's important to find, to seek help, whether that's through your church, whether that's through a psychiatrist, I choose a therapist, but you need to get that out of you. And you are a, like you, you was the victim. And I didn't realize that until I watched the show and seen something about human sex trafficking. That wasn't up until I would say maybe about seven years ago. I didn't even know anything about, wow, you was a victim. Like you're not this horrible person that, you know, people painted out to be because it was a force thing. It wasn't like I wanted to do um, doing that whole time, but that lasted about six years almost. Like, I don't know if anybody has any questions or. Well, I think we do have a question coming up, but um, let me let me ask you and take you back for a second. When you oh. were uh, being taken, um, 
did you see your grandmother during that time or were you secluded someplace else altogether? No, at one point I did. In the very beginning, when it was with the Romeo pimp, that's when I seen my grandmother. And I hate to say this, and I'm sorry, grandma, but I gotta be honest. It was kind of like she had a blind eye to it because when I would leave, um, you know, I wasn't like coming back right back or whatever. And she just figured like maybe she's out with her friends or whatever. That's why I think it's so important for parents to really pay attention to where your children are, who they are talking to. Don't just, you know, think like, oh, it's nothing. Because shortly after that, I was trapped and I was trapped for like good. Okay. Uh, we have a question uh, that has to do, uh, Stephanie Smith is uh, monitoring our Facebook questions. And so Stephanie, I think has a question that has to do with uh, self-defense or something, Some a comment from someone. Steph, do you have a comment? Maybe she can't hear me. Um, the, the real question is, it, it seems like, because we're talking about being snatched and being taken, um, I guess to the average person, it would look like, well, if you took self-defense classes, if you knew a little karate, you know, you'd be able to get away from this. But as you point out, and as Renee knows, and I know, um, it's not that obvious. Uh, you talk about the Romeo pimp. There's some subtlety into how someone is pulled into this. Uh, so could you address that a little bit more? And Renee, you may have something to say as well. Yeah, you know, the first pimps arrested in uh, Illinois were 17-year-old twin bro brothers in Dalton, Illinois. And they pimped the girls in their high school. Uh, so the question is, how does, how does two brothers that's in a high school with a principal and teachers and administrators get away with pimping the girls? Uh, because the real key is trust. They begin to trust. And so your guard is down because you go into school with them, you spend time with them, you get to know them. And um, so, and then after you build the trust, then they instill what they really want from you, which is fear. Once they get you to trust them, then they start with the fear. And just as Sister Walker said, you start with the Romeo pimp who pulls you in and these twin brothers had a way of, of pulling the girls in. And then you go into the gorilla pimp that lets you know they, gonna, they start telling you what they're going to do to you. They let you see it sometimes so that you'll understand they're not playing with you. Right. And so self-defense has its place, but what is self-defense to a child with a grown man? Yeah, exactly. And uh, we also don't want people to think um, mm -hmm. that they can just, you know, I think Lakeisha hit something really, really important. And that's the view of the black community about things like this. Don't tell it, don't go to counseling, keep your mouth closed, act like it didn't happen. And so what happens is we victimize victims again because Absolutely. we tear up their self-esteem. We don't allow them to be able to share or talk. And so I applaud Lakeisha and other survivors who are mm -hmm. telling their story because if yes. we don't tell it, it will happen to someone else. So there's someone who can be saved in that. Okay, Lakeisha, you wanna say something else about that? Yes, I agree with both of you all. And just to add to that, I wanna say, um, as far as the pimp thing, it's, it's definitely that man manipulation. Now with the Romeo pimp, it's purely man manipulation because a lot of them don't really get too physical. Some of them do, but it's not like as physical as with the gorilla pimp. With the gorilla pimp, they use both man manipulation and definitely a lot of fear because Maz was actually clicking guns to my head playing Russian roulette. Um, and the fear um, that I had, the trembling fear, not knowing if I would be killed or not. And I even had a friend who tried to rescue me. I'm gonna, uh, her name was Charmaine actually, but she tried to rescue me out of it. And she had gas and gas together to try to help me and this man put the gun to my head. The pimp put the gun to my head. You know what I mean? And I was too afraid because of mental control and because of what he was doing. Like, and I'm like, he'll really kill me because he, you know, he was saying I represented his money and he just killed me about it. Mm -hmm. uh, that's a good, good point too, um, of the whole idea of rescue. One of the things we want to get across tonight, because in the church community, um, Often we think we can ignore it or we can pray, pray it away or something like that or 
people, I know I've done workshops at churches and people, particularly ministers, want to say, well, I want to go out on the street and I want to help. And that's not helping because you don't know what to do. You haven't been trained to do anything and you can cause somebody more harm than you might otherwise. Okay. So that's not, that's not a good thing. Um, I noticed that um, our engineer uh, has Lolita Westbrook has put up our national human trafficking hotline information. Um, Renee, you want to say something about the hotline? Oh yeah. And, and <laughs> I encourage everyone to have in your phone, the hotline number and also the text, make sure you keep that and keep it in your phone. And just like Dr. Sell says, you know, you can be a hero, but you'll be a hero that might get not only that person killed, but yourself killed also. When they trained me, they took me, they took me to an area and it was dark. I didn't even see the pimps, you all. Uh, but they told me, don't be scared. Now you can't tell nobody, don't be scared because you're going to be scared. <laughs> and so when they did that, they jumped, they came out of the cars and came out of nowhere and asked me, and they called me all kinds of names and asked me whether, mm, where I was going. So if you see something that you sense, it's not going to hurt you to call the hotline. Don't second guess yourself. If you really have a problem with it, just call them and let them do their job. You give them the location, you pay attention, you know, because if you go anywhere near their girls, they're close by. Am I right, Lakeisha? They yes, are close yes. by and yes, they are yes, watching. Okay. Yes, they are. And they would not hesitate to try to hurt somebody because, again, it's like you represent their money. I mean, mm -hmm. they are trying to thrill, they might try to hurt you. I just would not um, recommend it. And to add okay. to what you was saying, Renee, what I would recommend though, is being a safe place. I don't know why people, and I just gotta say this, <laughs> but I feel like even now sometimes like I'm sharing the stuff or whatever, and it's like people are so afraid of the word human sex trafficking. I'm not gonna never stop saying it because I almost lost my life and by the grace of God, I'm alive. But I don't know why they so afraid. It's like just not a positive like word, I guess. And you can help with something as simple as sharing a video. You can help with like Miss Renee's organization, my organization, you can help with what Dr. Seals is doing. There's many ways that you can help or you can help by just, you know, being that safe place where you're not being judgmental when a person comes to you where they feel safe enough to tell you, hey, I'm in trouble. And then you know what to do after that, you know, Carla, hotline. A lot of times you do need to get the authorities involved, honestly. Because yeah. we have to remember, when we see the girls on the street, we have to remember, we may judge the way they dress, but the key thing is that they're being forced. They have lost their right. They've taken away their choice, and they're being forced out there. So when you look at them, don't say, oh, look at her. No, you got to be compassionate and be concerned about her. The challenge of today is that we are too caught up in ourselves and our family and no one else. That and, and, and where has that gotten us, you all? Look at our world today. And so we've got to turn things around, turn our mindsets around and think of others more than ourselves and begin to show concern, even if it should just call in the hotline number, even if it should just text and you have taken a step that may save someone's life. And that is very important. I think it's important too, uh, whether it's the church community in schools these are things that don't get talked about in school. You know, uh, they don't get talked about in churches. Uh, I went to a church and the pastor, I wasn't, at that point, I wasn't talking about that. We were in a service. And at the end of service, he said, go into my office. There's a mother in there who wants to talk to you. This woman's daughter had been taken. She got the daughter back, but the daughter was taken again. By this time, the daughter was older. And when she called the police, the police said, if you snatch her now, you're up on kidnap charging. So it's, you know, it's something that we just, it's so complicated, we don't understand it, but it's happening everywhere. Uh, saw somebody the other day at a wedding and they told me that somebody in their church or someone that they knew uh, was being trafficked or somebody had just been stolen or somebody's missing for months. Uh, these things are not given to the bad kids you know, that's not the case. They are, these young people are being coerced. And I want to say, it's not just girls. It's not just girls. 
Okay. So when we talk about these things, we have to be honest, we have to be open, and we have to know who to call. The hotline is, is perfect to text or to call. Um, I want to go for a second. Uh, Renee has on a t-shirt and I have on a t-shirt. So let's talk about the t-shirts that we have right now. Renee, you want to go? <laughs> yeah, this is a t-shirt from Atlanta, Georgia, from a museum out there that Dr. Sales bought me when we were out in Atlanta doing a workshop. And it is, uh, it's about human trafficking. On the back of it, it has these wonderful wording that really stirs you up. So every time I wear the t-shirts, the back of it gets more attention because people are reading the words. So people are standing behind me. Sometimes they give me the creep, but they read the back of the t-shirt and we have dialogue about it. Um, the t-shirt that Dr. Sales has on is from the Chicago Park District and we do human trafficking. See how God, God will infiltrate wherever he decides to infiltrate. And um, my job has been on the, the move uh, in educating people about human trafficking. So many people have, uh, we've used these t-shirts to fund teen programs. Now here's a big key. We say, why won't they just leave? Or why won't they just go? Now, Lakeisha told you how she started and the plight of where she started. She talked to you about her low self-esteem. People think we could just take the girls off the street. So if you take them off the street, where are you taking them to? What are you giving them? The pimp is clothing them and feeding them, even if it's in a negative way. And if they have them, if they're challenged mentally and with low self-esteem, you must have something to give them. You've got to help them get in school. You've got to help them get educated. You've got to help them get a place to live. And so there's a place up north where they bought property and they put mothers in their den mothers. I call them den mothers. And they actually brought the property to be able to go to court and get custody of these young people. So, but that, but everything takes money. You know, you can't go in, I can't go on jewels and say, I want some bananas, whatever. And then I'm gonna walk out, I'm gonna go to jail. <laughs> you know, I gotta pay. So it takes money for uh, these girls to be, and these young men. I've met young men that are surviving. You see the difference. We call the victims, the ones that's on the street. The ones like Lakeisha that have been rescued, that have come off, they are what we call survivors. They are survivors and we celebrate them. We celebrate them. Yes. yes. Lakeisha, you wanna say something? Oh. I'm, okay, I was just going to add to that. She brought me to the point. So um, for those who don't know, I have a nonprofit organization now, Honorable Women Inc. Um, so you can look me up if you know someone that needs help, honorablewomeninc.org. But also what I want to say is we have recently helped rescue about four um, young ladies recently. Now, these were willing workers. However, one of them has said that it was her very first night so I just want to add this because it's real, real important. Um, she explained it was her very first night, but she had no idea how dangerous it could be. So I think it's important for everyone to know, like, whether you're doing it willingly, whether you're not doing it willingly, you have no idea of the harm that can come to you, um, yes. which is being out, whether it's through the predator, whether it's through the girls that want to cut your face because they feel like you're taking a client, whether it's the pimp, or the, it's just anybody. So it's just not a lifestyle that you want to be a part of. Right. Absolutely. Oh. And what is growing is female pimps. Yes. That is what's growing. One girl can bring you in one year about $300,000 a year, one girl. So imagine if they have 10 times $300,000. That's, that's a lot of money. Drugs and gun sales are number one. Human trafficking is number two. Chicago is on the top. It's number nine now. In 2019, it was number nine on the top 10 list of human trafficking. And so when we think it's not happening, it's everywhere. And California was number one. California is huge, you know, it has a lot of cities and everything. So um, we've got to get involved. You're gonna be held accountable once you get told. <laughs> and you just been told. <laughs> Uh, you know, you talk about the cities. I did a workshop in Juneau, Alaska. And mm -hmm. so I looked up the stats, you know, because it's Juneau, Alaska. Who's in Alaska? You would be surprised at the, the rate of trafficking, sex trafficking in Juneau, in Alaska, California, in all Washington, all of those places. There is not a single state 
There is not a place that you can get away from this. So you, you need, we need to help our young people. And um, you talked about, Renee talked about money. Uh, their organizations, and if Lolita, if you could put that uh, uh, slide up again with our three organizations, but there are other organizations. I think Renee was probably talking about Reclaim 13 a little while ago. Mm -hmm. uh, they've, they've built facilities. Um, one of the groups that I like to follow is the Salvation Army because their Stop It program, uh, yeah. they, they come from a faith-based, and so does Reclaim 13. They come from a faith-based perspective and they help us understand that you can't just talk about the Lord and say, the Lord's gonna bless you. Here's a Bible, here you go. Uh, and they help us <laughs> to do that because there are also pimps who talk in church language. They use that also to make you think everything is okay. And so we have to be careful of the language that we use. But uh, uh, Renee, I'm sorry, uh, Lolita, I didn't go to it. So if you look at these, um, our three organizations, and also there are other organizations that you can donate to, places that have, that, that house young people taken off the street, they need everything from toilet paper to Absolutely. cash money. You will never know where they are because they're not going to tell you, but the organization can get things to them. So the Ezra Project is um, doing that. This is our first time doing this online uh, before we were in churches. And so we're looking to find how to do uh, more of a hybrid so that we can make churches aware of what's going on. So that's the Ezra Project. Renee, tell us a little bit about um, Compassion uh, Justice. Well, well, Compassion, Mercy, and Justice spends the, the bulk of our, our time is uh, education. Our, our whole focus is making sure we make you aware that it is going on. So we do a lot of trainings, workshops, and teaching. So when people call us, we come. Uh, so that's the main part of what we do. One thing, like Dr. Sell says, um, they the toiletries, sanitary napkins, just basic needs are things that they're going to need uh, for these young ladies. Um, and so that's real important. Uh, when you call these different organizations, they will tell you what they need. You know, I like we like to bring a whole lot of clothes that we take out of our closet. Sometimes they don't need that. So ask them what they need. Yes. And then they will tell you what they need. Because sometimes you pile up clothes and they got they they can't even, they got too many. And then they don't have what they really need. So let's ask them what they need because they know. Right. And uh Lakeisha, tell us about Honorable Women Inc. Yes, for Honorable Women Inc., we help those who are really, we deal mainly more than anything with the prevention. We also, we will rescue those like who need rescue. They come directly to us. Um, and mainly what I've been doing is I am a public speaker. <laughs> so I'm speaking, I'm telling my story everywhere that I can, anywhere that I get invited so that um, we can stop human sex trafficking in Chicago, which is our main mission. So anything that has to do with the stopping of human sex trafficking, that's where we are. And we also help the LGBTQ community um, as well, teen girls and also women. Yes. Uh, One thing that uh, the uh, human trafficking community, uh, the PIMSA, they're very organized. They're organized from state to state. They, they, the, the main thing they wanna do is remove the, the, the uh, victim away from family, friends, whoever. They were moving from state to state. Um, they find out where big events are happening and then they bring the bus, they bring the girls. They mm -hmm. bring the girls, they bring the boys so that they can provide the service because that is their money maker. Human trafficking makes more money than Google, Nike, and Starbucks combined. Now you Starbucks lovers <laughs> and you Nike lovers, Human trafficking supersedes all three combined. Billion dollar industry. And that's why they, when I met the, a 14 year old that was a survivor, the 14 year old went through a horrific time because she also like Lakeisha tried to escape. They caught her and she was so profitable for them. In order to get her to stay, they grabbed another girl and killed her in front of her and the other group that they had so that she would understand they're not playing. 
She was able to get away from help from other people, but it was a lot of damage that was done, a lot of counseling that was needed. So the first thing, the, the, you, you have me that educate, you have Lakeisha that speaks, but you have these organizations that they do the, the major work that I would say, and they actually walk them through the process of being clean, clean from the dirt and filth of what they tried to tell them they were. They take them through the process of counseling. And a lot of times they pump them with drugs, you all. So some of them are coming. Some of them have had children uh, by the pimps. Uh, so they have had a lot of challenges in their lives. And you imagine a 12 or 13 year old that has never had sex, but this is how she is introduced to they, their form of intimacy. Right. And we have to recognize um, again, going back to something Lakeisha said before, we have to recognize the damage that is done when we blame the victim, when yes. we don't try mm -hmm. to help. If you're in a situation, if you're in a church, if you're in a, in a home, pay attention to things that change. Um, are patterns changing? Is somebody going out late at night? Are they staying out later? Are friends changing? Pay attention. So I want to put, uh, if, if Lolita can put up that um, uh, slide on PACT, uh, we're going to start, uh, I've been working on a book uh, on this for a while, Renee knows. Um, but what, what we want to do is to start putting out some things that churches can do that will help them. So I've come up with the acronym, PACT. Um, pray and probe the Bible, awareness, consider individuals and talk about it. And so for just a quick second, and we'll be putting this on our, uh, on the Ezra web page and putting some other things together to share with you. But under, um, this is under pray and pray and probe the Bible. This is a spiritual issue because their spirits are being destroyed by these people and by these situations and by the pain they're going through, but do not spiritualize it. Don't say, well, God's going to bring you through. Yes, God will bring them through and God sent you there to help do something or to tell Amen. something, whatever. <laughs> so we need to know that. There is an organ, there is a, a thing called the um, Interfaith uh, Toolkit on Human Trafficking. That, take that down for a second, Renee, and, and I, I mean, um, Lolita, I'll come back to it. The Interfaith Toolkit was put together and has been going on for several years. They've put together, the National Council of Churches, I believe, has put together groups of um, faith-based groups of all denominations, Baha'i, Catholic, um, Methodist, all kinds of organizations. And they've put together a toolkit that you can download that tells you how each faith-based group is addressing this. There may be prayer, prayer vigils. There are special days of prayer. There are workshops that they do, all of that. But guess who's not in the interfaith toolkit? We're not. Not Black Pentecostals, not Black Baptists, none of the Black um, uh, major organizations, AME, AME Zion, none of those are in the toolkit. In our community, which makes up a, a really large percentage, the Black and Brown community make up a large percentage of who's taken. And yet mm. we don't have the conversation. So we need to do that. So, okay, put yes. that back up again. So there are things that your churches can do, organize prayer meetings, uh, publish a statement on trafficking, make it a ministry within your church. The second thing is awareness. Pay attention to individually to your surroundings. Uh, look at your church policies. Do you have policies against abuse for children? Are you paying attention to what happened? You know, there are lots of places in churches where kids get in trouble because nobody's looking. Everybody's in service. Nobody's out in the hallway. Nobody's in the parking lot. So we need to be aware uh, in our homes and in our churches uh, as well. Consider individuals. Are you caring for individuals? Don't think all teenagers are the same. Don't think they all get in trouble or they're all really good. Pay attention to individual young people and to the, and, and to the people who come into your church. One of the things, I gotta say this, one of the things that bugs me in the black church is when they say, hug your neighbor. I ain't hugging nobody. I don't know who that is. They don't know who that is. 
You don't know what's being, what's going around you. We have to be careful of the way we talk, the things we do, because we're 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 friendly, we're open. We, we that's who we are, and yet predators are in our midst. And then lastly, talk about it. Talk about these things. Get involved with other organizations. Have workshops. Invite Lakeisha. Invite Renee to come and talk to your church, to talk to your organizations, and we can do something about it. So pack, make a pact. Pray probe the Bible, pay attention to the scriptures, as well as to how you're teaching certain lessons. There's a lot in the Bible that has to do with trafficking, but that's another mm -hmm. one. Um, awareness of, of your surroundings and, and consideration of individuals and talk about it. So those are things we want, and we will be putting those on the website. So uh, with other things behind them. So we want to- Dr. Sales, my mm -hmm. friends and I that are, uh, this is about five or six of us uh, that are involved in Compassion, Mercy and Justice. I don't do anything by myself because I can't accomplish too much alone. Uh, but there are, there's a, there are men in our group and women, it's not just females and men have come alongside us and they are supporting us uh, and helping us to get the word out. So they come right there and make sure that they come with us to make sure we're safe. They come to take pictures of workshops and things that we need to put on. They manage our website. Um, and so each of us come together because we all felt the need to at least say something about this. So we spoke up and God has had us on this journey for a while, for a while. Yes. One yes. thing I also want to say, when I started Dr. Sales, um, I thought the police were uh, be very educated about this. And I found out that they were almost like pimps themselves <laughs> because they would take the girls off the street and lock them up or put them somewhere where somebody could do some more damage to them. And that was just strictly out of their ignorance. So in the beginning, um, I ended up going to several districts and, and training the police officers about human trafficking. Who would have thought? Only God. Um, so now they have uh, an actual task force. They have broadened and everything. And how I got their attention, I really sat around them talking and I looked at one of the commanders, I said, you, you all ain't nothing but, a, but pimps. And you know, they were a little offended, um, but it got their attention. And he said, explain yourself. You know, they, they staunch. And I said, but you taking those girls, did you talk to them? Did you ask them questions? Now they ask and now they're helping. And that's a good thing. Yeah. So um, we got to speak up. You never know who you're going to help. I'll tell you another place where there was a problem and... Uh... This has come to our attention and, and more and more it's growing and that's hospitals. Um, hospitals would get women, women in and sometimes that woman who has groomed is basically the pimp had, will take that girl in and say, you know, this is my sister, this is my cousin, I brought her in here and stay with her. Hospitals now will separate them and make sure those girls are okay and hospital staff uh, is being trained now to pay attention and know what's going on. So there's a difference in the way people are seeing it. It's not enough, but it's a start. And I applaud Renee for her boldness in speaking up and uh, the fact that uh, police officers now in every city, I think there is a task force now. It yes. is not just something that uh, you know, maybe is here, there, hit and miss. It's a, there's a task force everywhere. They don't have enough police officers. And sometimes you call the police, but if that police officer is not part of the task force, they don't know what to do. Another thing that a, a police officer on task force said, um, don't, if your child is not home, don't call and say she ran away or he ran away because then they treat it differently. You yes. have to say, I think something has happened to her or to him. Yes. And then they deal with it, they, then they deal with it differently. If they ran away, it's their own volition. They just, you know, whatever. So you can't do that. We have to watch our language. We have to know how to talk about it. We have to know what's going on. And um, again, as we've been saying, speak up, speak up. Lakeisha, you want to add something else? Yes, um, speak up is actually part of our movement. <laughs> I'm always saying speak up because my voice was snatched for a long time and I just could not get that that voice. But I just thank God that I have it now 
and I'm able to speak for women like me and children like me and whoever's suffering with it. And what I want to add about the police is that never, I always felt afraid to go to them because I felt like they was going to lock me up. In fact, it was a party that was done where all, well, it was police there. So I'm like, they not going to help me like some of them is getting service too, if I was to just yeah. be honest. <laughs> I mean, you got good and get bad cops. And then also um, the night that I escaped, I did bump into like the um, detective. I think he's like a private detective or something. You know how they be undercover. Um, and I guess they arrest girls like that out there. But that was my first time, like, you know, on that stroll or whatever. So I just mm -hmm. tried to tell him. And next thing you know, sirens and stuff going off. And then the police was after me. So he thought that I was just a person willingly doing it out there. So I couldn't get help that way. So I think it's very, I definitely commend you, uh, <laughs> Ms. Renee, for dealing with the police. And I think we need to continuously just let them know that, like, they need to be a safe place as well, because I would- They're doing a phenomenal job now. They're doing a yeah. wonderful job. Yeah. Much better. Yeah. Because I, I did see about the, um, you know, about everything they started. and But back then, it was just like, <laughs> I just, I was afraid to go to them at all. You said, Lakeisha, when we started, you said you usually start by saying where you are now, but you started yes. backwards for us. So why don't yes. you tell us a little about where you are now? Well, now um, I, I'm the founder and the CEO of Honorable Women, Inc. So of course that pimp was wrong about me. Um, I'm very successful in that. And then I've graduated actually to a public speak. I wasn't even considering myself to be a public speaker. I was just saying my story, but um, God has really blessed me out of me telling my story. And um, I've became kind of like a motivational speaker too, where people are wanting to know more of the stories, like just period with me. So um, I'm very excited about that. And then we coming up on a whole year um, anniversary. So yay, I'm just so happy about that. Yeah. And we made it, but thank you. <laughs> okay, good. Terrific, terrific. Uh, we have a few minutes left and I understand uh, that there are a number of people sending love and comments and so forth online. I don't know that we have any questions because uh, I can't see what's going on on Facebook Live, but um, I do know that people are responding and that's good. I do truly hope that um, uh, this will be on um, YouTube and on Facebook and still on Facebook uh, when we're over. And I trust, I hope that you'll have other people watch as well because it's, it's a story that needs to be told. And it's a story that unfortunately happens over and over again. Um, everyone is not as fortunate as Lakeisha, uh, you know, to be able to make it out. Um, or to have, uh, everybody's not fortunate enough to have parents or whatnot. There's some other places I want you to look as well. Um, when I think about TED Talks, um, you always think about TED Talks, somebody talking about how they you know, invented some new thing or whatever, some scientific something. But there are a number of TED Talks on sex trafficking. And it's interesting because one woman, and I don't have the name in front of me, but she talked about how if you saw her, you'd say, oh, what a nice little white lady, middle class, lives in a nice community. She actually was um, in her family moved all the time because her father was in the army. And so she was the lonely kid. And guy comes up to her, becomes her friend. Uh, one day he says, well, listen, I'm a, I'll give you a ride home. But instead of taking her home, he took her someplace else. He drugged her. She was, he was having her slip out of her house while her parents were asleep. Um, she now has a business that puts soap in hotel rooms and the hotline number is on that soap. So there are ways out, but everybody is susceptible to what is going on. So ask not for whom the bell tolls. Unfortunately, it may be tolling for someone in your family, in your neighborhood that you don't know, but you see things going on that are wrong. Um, so we need to speak up, we need to speak out, we need to let people know, and we need to support the organizations that are doing good work, that are doing this work and uh, pay attention to what young people are doing. So ladies, we have about five minutes. I'm not hearing anything about what's going on in the rest of the world, in the Facebook world or YouTube world or any place. So 
if you ladies would like to have uh, closing remarks, we'll just go there. Okay. I don't know who wants to start. Lakeisha, you you see start? the ribbon that I have on. Yes. Uh, I have this little blue ribbon. This is the color of human trafficking. Something simple that each of you all can do at your church, at your organization. You can get your ribbon and cut it up and you can attach uh, the hotline number to it and begin to pass it out to the teams, to your community, and just something as small and simple as that to educate people. Uh, we really, really encourage you to not sit on this because somebody is going to need you. And you never know, like I said, and I'll say it again, whose life you might save by just taking that one step and put that hotline number and text-free number in your phone. Don't rely on your mind because you know your mind can play tricks on you. I appreciate the opportunity to share with you all this evening. Thank you so much. Okay, and I want to go back for a second. I know that there are a couple of events that you have, and with the pandemic, I'm not sure if the Park District is sponsoring events this year or- We're doing a 5K um, uh, in October. Okay. October is the as the anti-slavery day nationally in October the 18th or the 19th. And so we pick October because of that. That is the national anti-slavery day all over the country. And so we do a 5K walk to raise money for teen programs to help our teens. If you look at our city, if you look at your city, what are we hearing where the most challenge is? And it is with our young people. They have to have something in exchange to do. So we've got to give them opportunities to learn other things outside of learning the streets. Okay. You can't keep letting the street teach them. And January is, is it January is Human Trafficking Month, right? Yes. Mm -hmm. okay. President okay. Obama made it a national holiday. Okay, so we need mm -hmm. to pay attention and be involved. And I want to, that reminds me, I want to say something before we get off that I probably shouldn't say, but anyway, Lakeisha, do you have something? <laughs> I just wanted, I just would like to say if you're a teen or a child or even an adult that's watching and you're struggling with self-love, um, go talk to one. Don't, don't keep that in because it can lead to so many other things. Uh, I went through that for many years where I just didn't know how to love myself. And it can be as simple as taking a walk or just doing something every day that you want to do. You know what I mean? Like, um, so I just want to say that I talk a lot about self-love because I felt like that was what led me into the arms of a predator in the beginning um, because I, I just didn't love myself and I didn't realize it. And I love all of you. Thank you so much, Dr. Seals, for the platform. Thank you, Ms. Renee. I definitely enjoyed this conversation. You see, I've been like holding my phone here. Like, <laughs> I had to calm down. Like, oh my goodness, I got so much to say. <laughs> Well, thank you. Thank you so much. We're glad that you were able to share and to talk. And the what I want to say right now, and I'm going to say it, and you know, I'm going to say it. Uh, today, the um, uh, uh, Juneteenth has become a national holiday. And I think a lot of people are really excited about that. And I'm excited about it. I think it's a good thing. But I think that we need to not rest on that. Juneteenth was not the day the slaves were freed. They found out three years later that they had been free three years and six months earlier. So we need to pay attention. What I'd rather see and what I'd rather see us fight for is the George Floyd law to be adopted by the Senate. I'd like to see the John Lewis um, voting rights adopted by this country. I'd like to see our city do something about the violence, not only sex trafficking, but the killing of our young people. Catch some crooks, you know, catch a few criminals and make us feel good about it. That says that we are truly free. So as we go into the Juneteenth holiday, I wanna tell everybody, pay attention to what's going on around you. Don't just get hung up in the celebration of Juneteenth, but realize that it's about real freedom. It's about what God has delivered us from, and it's about what we can do. So happy Juneteenth to everyone. And above all, stay safe, pay attention, and thank you for joining us. We'll see you next month when we interview two authors on SHIFT. Thank you. God bless.
ます。